Welcome to the first IAAF World Indoor Championships from Indianapolis, Indiana, the amateur sports capital of the world. Today, its visitors include Greg Foster, who yesterday set a world record in the 60-meter hurdles. From the Soviet Union, Sergei Bubka, world record holder in the pole vault. From East Germany, Heike Drexler, world record holder in the long jump. U.S. indoor sprint sensation, Lee McRae. Jackie Joyner Kersey, who won the Sullivan Award, but did not make the finals here. We'll show you why. And also, disappointment for Eamon Coghran. Yesterday, the chairman of the boards met disaster in his heat in the 1,500 meters. You can see him here in the green and white, moving up on the outside. In the turn, a little collision with Dieter Baumann of West Germany. Coghran goes down, gets up, but does not qualify for the final. Sports presents the first IAAF World Indoor Championships. This is the Hoosier Dome in Indianapolis, Indiana. And this is the site of the first World Indoor Track and Field Championship. Hello, everybody. I'm Charlie Jones. Indoor track and field has been very popular for years here in the United States, now growing in popularity throughout the rest of the world. But indoor track and field started in the year 1863 in England, but it took 124 years before we would hold a world championship. In a world championship, you want to have world records, and you always have controversy. Well, these things are happening here. But first things first. Earlier today, the beautiful opening ceremonies and Up With People set the tone. This, of course, followed by the parade of athletes, Canada, West Germany, Spain, the Soviet Union, a total of 90 countries are gathered here. Mike Conley carries the flag for the United States. A total of 494 athletes. This is Mycel Malone, 18-year-old high school senior from North Central High School here in Indianapolis, carrying the torch. One of America's bright young stars, the 1986 National Junior Champion at 100 and 200 meters. And you know the knees were shaking. The official proclamation by the mayor of Indianapolis, William Hudnut III. And now on behalf of the citizens of the city of Indianapolis, it is my pleasure and privilege to declare the first World Indoor Track and Field Championships officially open. That, of course, took place earlier today. Now joining us on the telecast, Frank Shorter with the gold and silver medal in the Olympics and 1984 Olympian Missy Kane in the women's 1500 meters. Frank, first things first, the men today. 
60 meters for men. Lee McRae from the United States been dominating indoors, but Ben Johnson from Canada hasn't really run that much, and he's looked tremendous in the heats. That race is a toss-up. In the 1,500 meters, Eamon Coughlin's out, but Marcus O'Sullivan from Ireland, some think he's the next chairman of the boards, up against Jose Abascal from Spain. The best in Europe will have to get away from O'Sullivan if Jim Spivey from the United States has the race of his life. Maybe, just maybe, he'll have his breakthrough. Missy, outstanding women events today. You're right, Charlie. Heike Drexler from East Germany, a real superstar. Last week in New York, she set the world record in the long jump. Here she's added to 200. Yesterday in the semifinals, she coasted to 22.84, close to the world record. Also in the hurdles, the top three hurdlers of last year are here. But the sad thing is that Jackie joyner Kersey will not be in that final. Two weeks ago here in Indianapolis, Jackie Joyner Kersey received the Sullivan Award as the outstanding amateur athlete of 1986. But last night here in Indianapolis, she had her problems in the semifinal heat in the women's 60-meter hurdles. She stumbled just a little bit coming out of the blocks, but then she hit the second hurdle and she lost her concentration. She did not make the finals. After last night's race, she visited with Larry Rossin, who's joined us for this telecast. I'm with one of her main support systems, Al Joyner, Olympic gold medalist in the triple jump, and Jackie Joyner, Kersey, silver medalist in the heptathlon. It's not always that good, is it? No, it isn't. As tonight, I had it not such a good race. Maybe you could take us through it. What happened out of the blocks? You got away cleanly, did you? Yes, coming out the blocks. You're in lane seven, let me add, in red. Go ahead. Right, lane seven, not came out the blocks. I stumbled, but I regained my balance, and going into the first hurdle, I was pretty good. Then coming off the first one, going into the second one, when I started to drive, I hit and stumbled, and that really threw me off. And now, then, you managed to gain your composure a bit then and, and pick yeah. yourself together. I tried to get back in the race, but I don't think, I don't think I'll make it to the finals. Well, I noticed Stephanie Hightower left, which uh, consoling you, another great hurdler over there. Congratulations on your 1986 award as the Sullivan Award Top Athlete of the year amateur athlete you did a great job last year and we're all with you congratulations thank you and what a beautiful lady she is and what a beautiful family these youngsters out of uh, east st louis and uh, and they are a, a great addition to the american international scene not only as far as their athletic ability but as far as the, all of the other intangibles that they bring the next live running event that we will have will be the women's 60-meter hurdles. And uh, this could be, Missy, a very exciting event. I think you're right, Charlie, because we have three of the fastest in the world. And Oshkenat from East Germany, she ran very fast yesterday. Last week, she upset Yondanka Donkova, who is the world record holder. So this is going to be very exciting. The key for this race, I think, is the start. Frank? Also, Charlie, I think it should be pointed out that Jackie Joyner Kersey does not specialize in the hurdles, and yet she is good enough that she would have qualified for the final, I think, had she not hit that hurdle yesterday. And so it's taking nothing away from our Sullivan Award winner to say that she's not in the field today. And her world record in the heptathlon. You saw, of course, the world record for the women's 60-meter hurdle, 775, Yordanka Danka of Bulgaria. She will be in lane six, and she is quite an athlete. You're right. Last year, Charlie, she set the world record three times. She lowered it to 1226. She basically she doesn't hurdle she runs through the hurdles i think that's the big key but here in the u.s the last couple of weeks she doesn't look quite as sharp and oshkanat who's a tall runner basically has been leaving her after the second hurdle cornelia oshkanat of east germany will be in lane five so they will be running side by side oshkanat is ranked two in the world last year she upset uh, as missy said uh, your Donka Donka last week in the u.s championships the tack meet and she beat her yet in yesterday's qualifying heat I was surprised. It seemed like Oshkanat just ran easily away from her, but yet Donkova is the best in the world. So it might, maybe she eased up yesterday, but I think one of the keys is the start. It seemed like Donkova was rising very high up. She seemed to come up too quick. You want to stay low, so that's something to look at. All right, representing the United States in lane seven will be Stephanie Hightower Leftwich. Now, does, does Stephanie have any kind of an opportunity here to win? She's gotten better this season. She started off and she broke her elbow earlier in the season and she looked pretty ragged. But now each meet she's getting better and better. And one thing, she's short. She has an easy time getting over the hurdles, but she's not quite as quick between. And of course, uh, indoor track and field, those of you who have followed it, a lot of things, uh, some call it almost an indoor circus. And Dwight Stone's covering the field of it, Dwight. 
already is a circus here, and Heike Drexler, who we've all been talking about and will continue to talk about throughout this competition, is up for her fifth jump in the long jump. She's already obliterating this particular field, and she will have a chance to run the 200 later on in this meet today. And you think that she is pointing towards a ladies' Olympic record? Well, I think that, Charlie, I think that she's going to attempt the same thing as Carl Lewis from Helsinki this summer in Rome. I think she'll run the 100 and the relay and the long jump. And I think it's a possibility in Seoul she could try for four gold medals. That's the first foul she's had in the competition. And the way she landed in the pit, that's a very good way to get an injury. But she's such a strong athlete, she can, she can do things like that. But she knows when she's not quite right. Even though she's only three inches over, she knew there was no chance that that would be a complete jump. Plus, she has to save her energy to run the 200 meters later on today. <laughs> All right, let's go back to the hurdles. Let's take a look at the complete field and the women's 60-meter hurdles, and we'll be taking a close-up look at them. And lane one from Holland is Marianne Oschlager. In lane one, she's the Dutch record holder and sixth in the European Championships. In lane two from Great Britain is Leslie Ann Skeet, the British record holder. A lot of record holders here. In lane three, Rita Hagley of Switzerland. Are you ready? Of course, the Swiss record holder. In lane four, Zagorcheva of Bulgaria. Dina Gazor, uh, Gazor, always have trouble with that. Zagorcheva and uh, Ginka is in lane four, ranked third in the world last year. Cornelia Oshkanad of East Germany is in lane five. And you have to label her as the favorite, even though next to her lane six is your Danka Dankova from uh, Bulgaria, the world record holder in lane six. Oh, she's going to look so good yesterday. She seemed in complete control. I think that helped. And there's Donka. But Stephanie Hightower Leftwich of the United States is in lane seven. And this could be an advantage for Stephanie because she can be pulled along. That's uh, true. Having these three girls there will help. And in lane eight, Alushka Lopez of Cuba. So that is the field in the women's 60-meter hurdles. Five flights of hurdles indoors. And a very attractive setting here in the Hoosier Dome in Indianapolis. And of course, indoors, the start, Missy, is so all important in the short races. It is, Charlie, especially in the hurdles, because you have to come out quick get your steps down, get your pattern for that first hurdle. And here, of course, they have electronic blocks, so that might be a, a new factor here at this meet. And with the electronic blocks, uh, it is there to pick up the false starts. We'll be talking about that, the speakers you see behind it so that everybody can hear the gun at the same time. And if you leave too soon, the pressure on the blocks sends a little beep tone into the ear of the recall gun, and it is then could be could be fired, but still there is the discretion of the official. Eight lanes indoors. The women's 60 meter hurdles for the world championship. Oli Schlager, Leslie Ansky, Hagley, Zagorcheva, Hoshkanat. Donkova, Hightower Leftwich, and Lopez. It's a fair start. Oshkadot with the start. She pulls Dakova with her. It is Oshkadot and Docker, a two-person race. And Yordanka Dakova cannot close on her. Cornelia Oshkadot of East Germany wins the world title. And the smile tells it all. Charlie, I was surprised. This was a much closer race than we saw yesterday. But yet she had that edge. And I think that's what carried her to the win. Right here we watch. Very good start all across the board there. Oshkanat hits the first hurdle quickly, keeps her balance right there, but now you see Donkova coming back on her. Right here it's a question, but Oshkanat has that lead, which carried her to the win. And now NBC's photo finish camera. Oshkanat, the torso is what counts first. Donkova second. 
Zagorcheva of Bulgaria third. That, of course, is all unofficial. But that is the way that we see the first World Indoor Championship in the women's 60-meter hurdles. And an isolated look at these two top hurdlers. Right there, you watch their body. They stay very, very much in the middle of their lane. They have a lot of control over the hurdle. It looks like they're just running. It's not they're, like they're jumping the hurdles. They're just running through the hurdles. And that's the key for the European hurdlers while they're over the Americans. And as this was going on, right before this, actually, kind of like as we were coming on the air, you may have picked up the roar of the crowd in the background, and that is because of the men's walk. Dwight? Well, here we are in the last lap. Both Soviet walkers feeling themselves out. They were looking at each other the entire race, and they're just stalking each other. And you can't draft, obviously, in the walk. There's no wind inside. But watch the athletes' feet. The idea is that they must stay in constant contact with the ground. If they lose contact with the ground, they get one warning. Second warning, they're out. And I'm going to leave it up to you to watch some of these guys when it really starts to get important, when it really starts to happen. The last part of the straightaway, just watch these guys' feet. A little bit of shoving going on there. It's difficult to see who won the race. Both Soviets, very, very drained after that competition. Shinilov, we have as the winner in the walk at 5,000 meters. Pribilinets finishing second in that. And, and that, the, the walk really brought the crowd to their feet here. You know, anytime you get those athletes close together, there's not a lot of sprinting they're supposed to do at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the walk. Pribilinets from, from Czechoslovakia uh, ended up second on a on a flash at the end of the race. Uh, very interesting, but you have to watch. They get excited and they start to leave the ground. It's very, very difficult to stay in contact with the ground. Unofficial results, but if it stands, it would be a world record for Shinilov. Now, here are two athletes that are out of the high jump competition. The world record holder on your right with the long blonde hair, Patrick Schoberg from Sweden. World record holder at 7, 10 and 3 quarters began the competition at 7, 7 and a quarter. This was his opening height and this is his final attempt. The whole point of starting high is to strike fear into the hearts of your competitors. But if you have misses, it doesn't matter anymore. He leaves the competition with a zero as a mark. Still to come in the first World or Indoor Track and Field Championships, the men's dash, and it could be a record. Don't go away. at the World Championships. You've already heard the voice of Dwight Stones in addition to covering the men's walk, which was a giant surprise to all of us. But that's but that's the great part of live television coverage. You also be covering the field events and we have some very exciting field events. Well, Charlie, I think I'm biased, obviously. The high jump is probably the best field event at this meet. Maybe the pole vault's pretty good, but the high jump has everybody. There is no one missing from this particular competition, except now Patrick Schoberg, the world record holder, has gone out of the competition with a zero, starting too high. The complexion of the competition is changing because of the fact that he is out. Now guys who thought maybe they were good for fourth or fifth are now starting to think about a medal in this competition. So it's changing the complexion of the competition. And that's interesting when they start saying, hey, this is happening and that is happening. Now I can do this. Exactly. And it improves everything. Now last night we had the finals in the men's long jump. Dwight was there and let's go to that coverage. Larry Myricks, who has always been one of our most consistent competitors in the long jump, up for his second attempt in Friday night's long jump competition. And he finally gets into one. 26 feet, 10 inches for Larry Myricks, taking the lead by a great deal, giving the other competitors something to shoot for. And here is one of his main competitors, Robert Emion of the Soviet Union, number one ranked long jumper in the world in 1986. He was having his problems all night long. This was his best jump on the fourth attempt, 26 feet, 3 inches, only good enough for fourth. Now, Paul Imorti of Nigeria for his fifth attempt. He comes down the runway and just edges Emian at 26 feet, 3 and a half inches, which moves him into second place. Myrick's up for his final attempt. He's already got four marks that are better than the second best mark of any other athlete, and he saves his best for last. On his final attempt, Myricks jumps 27 feet, 
to demolish this competition and win the gold medal in the first World Indoor Championships. Now, a little controversy. Giovanni Evangelisti, the bronze medalist from L.A., was tied with Imorti for the second place jump. He had to have a better second jump to break the tie, and it looked as though this might have just been far enough. But they called a foul, and he did not like the sound of that. And he's helping the officials, too. <laughs> They go to look, he wants to see exactly where he fouled, he wants to see the mark in the plasticine, and he insists, no mark, no foul. But you can see here, as his foot leaves the board, he will break the wood, and there's a small mark in the plasticine. That's a foul, his mark does not count, and he must have known it was far enough to break the tie with Imorti. So once again, Giovanni Evangelisti ends up third in an international competition. And here are the official results. Larry Marks, the winner, 27 feet even. Imorti finishing second, Evangelisti third, and Emmy on fourth. <laughs> Stay tuned. Next, we'll have the women's 800 meters. Christina Wachtel of East Germany would be the favorite. Let's see how Juetta Clark of the... championships and the next running event the women's 800 meters and the world record 158.42 Siegfried Vodars of East Germany holds that record and here is a look at the field in lane one from Romania is Maria Pintea in lane two from Great Britain is Janet Bell in lane three is Christina Voktel of East Germany and she is the favorite Leibov Kiyakina of the Soviet Union is in four Slobodanka Kolovets of Yugoslavia is in fifth. Gabriela Sidlakova of Czechoslovakia is in sixth. And uh, it's a pleasure as an announcer now to, to welcome Joetta Clark and Diana Richburg of the United States after the rest of those names. Should really be a fun race. Okay. There is a look at the two Americans. 167 on the right is Joetta Clark. 169 on the left is Diana Richburg. This track here, by the way, is a 200 meter indoor track so at 800 meters of course it will be four laps and an excellent track we've had very good times all well, the athletes seem to enjoy running on this track it's a mondo track and we'll be talking about that later in the telecast missy the strategy at 800 meters i love the 800 meters charlie because it's a, a pure combination of speed and yeah, endurance it's long yeah. enough to have some tackles involved because they do break to get it short enough to keep it very exciting and those assignments Whoever has the best kick coming down that last 100 meters. And Christina Wachtel in lane three from East Germany. The favorite here. And they're having a bit of a technical problem with Missy's microphone. We'll be working on that. There are six lanes here. So we have two runners lining up in, uh, you know, together in the lanes for the start of the women's 800 meters. A total of eight competitors. And of course, ideal conditions indoors here at the Hoosier Dome. Pintea, Bell, Vactel, Kiryukina, Kolovitz, Sedlakova, Clark, and Richburg, the field. And Missy Kane, we now have a new microphone on you, so it should be Hopefully. a fun race. I love the 800, like I said before, and I think Joetta Clark from the United States, she's been having the best season ever for her, and she's going to have to be aggressive, though. She's going to have to get out quickly, because, and she likes to run from the front, so we'll see. She needs to be up towards the front if she wants to place here. And we had a little delay. We talked earlier. Remember a moment ago, the speakers that we had behind the starters? Uh, in the dash well we had the same kind of speakers here and they were but they were up in lane eight and with two runners in lane eight uh, they had to move the speaker so that is pause for the uh, cause for the delay and now we're set to go the women's 800 meters looks like kiryukina is going to break for the pole but walk Bachtel is right on her inside shoulder but kiryukina cut her in just a little bit it's legal but it looks like here, those the faster runners are going for the pole and wanting to control the race. And of course, that means that it could develop very quickly into a tactical race. Number 111 running three, as you see, is Kolovitz of Yugoslavia. 
fast pace right here, 28.5 at the uh, 400 at the 200 meter mark, excuse me, which is could be a world record pace right now. And it looks like they are pushing the pace all the way. They haven't settled in right now. Kiryukina looks very strong in the front, and so does Bakhtil. So it is Kiryukina, the Soviet Union, who is setting the early pace. She has the world record, Charlie, for 600 meters, so she's got a lot of speed as well as endurance. Intermediate time at 400 meters, just over a minute. It's slowing down a little bit here at 60 seconds, and I think we're going to see a fast last 200. It is Kiryakina, Vakto, from uh, Yugoslavia, Kolovets, then from Czechoslovakia, Sedlakova, Janet Bell, Joetta Clark. These two front runners look very much in control right here. They looked relaxed, which is the key for sprinting. You need to stay relaxed this last 200 meters. And the bell lap, one lap to go. Okay, now you can see the race develop. They're going to their arms because their legs are tired here, so you've got to go to your arms. And it looks like the Yugoslavian is trying to make a move on the outside. And here comes Christina Bakhtil on the outside of Kiryakina. And here is Bakhtil down the final straight as she pulls away. And going for second place is Sedlakova, Czechoslovakia. Christina Bakhtil of East Germany, the European champion, captures the world championship here unofficially just over a couple of minutes and we will be back with more of the world indoor track and field championship from indianapolis right after these messages from your local station thank you Mark. great to hear your voice glad that you're joining us on this coverage he's outstanding track star in his own right here are the official results in the women's 60 meter hurdles Cornelia oshkin out of east germany the winner of the time 782 well, I must tell you that I had a neat time earlier this week, uh, and our NBC colleague, Paul Page, uh, covers the motorsports. Also, the voice of the Indianapolis 500 lives here in Indianapolis and took me on a, oh, I'd say a beautiful tour of his city. So uh, this is how it was. Well, Charlie, it's great to have you in Indianapolis. Welcome to my hometown. Well, it's great to be here because this is a city that is fascinated by speed. Well, there's no question about it. We are at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the world's greatest race course. You may be able to hear in the background, during this time of year, they actually test the race cars, though the track is only used once a year, and that's for the Indianapolis 500-mile race. This year celebrates its 76th anniversary. And, of course, right behind us is one of the greatest museums if you are into any kind of racing. The Speedway Hall of Fame Museum has an uncomparable collection of automobiles. It's really remarkable. And speaking of special cars, we're sitting in one. Well, I thought, for a personage <laughs> of, of your exquisite taste... Thank you. Thank you very ...this much. magnificent car is a 1925 Duesenberg, sir. And this car was responsible for the saying of, it's a doozy. Absolutely. And it was built here in Indianapolis. This car, like s over 70 other automobiles, great marks like Stutt, Sand, Duesenberg, all made in the city of Indianapolis, and at the turn of the century was actually the motor capital of the world. All right, show me more of your city. Bill Sporley, let's drive on. You're so good. <laughs> this, this is really made, you know that. <laughs> it's both of us, there's no doubt about it. We're coming up on the Union Station. It was built here in 1888. You mean it was built by the Yankees right after the Civil War? No, Rebel Brad, not at all. <laughs> the situation was that there were four railroads here in Indianapolis. They decided it would be cost effective if they all combined together, built one Union Station for their passenger terminals. What are they doing with it now? Well, they've taken this magnificent old building that you, you literally couldn't afford to build today, and they've made it into a festival marketplace. Good food inside? Magnificent food inside. You're buying dinner tonight? Absolutely not. Then move on, Bill. <laughs> Let's see more of your city, old cheap one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Charlie, this is my favorite. This is the Indianapolis Children's Museum. Well, now I know why it's your favorite. Oh, no, Charlie, it's more than that. This is the world's largest children's museum. But it's just for little kids, isn't it? Oh, it's for them. It's for everybody. In fact, they have an expression here. This is where children grow up and adults don't have to. Hey, this is my kind of museum. You bet. Hey, 
stage, you brought me to a television station. What is it? Well, of course, this is important to the city of Indianapolis. You see, Indianapolis is the birthplace of a number of great television stars. In fact, this very television station was where David Letterman got his start. Oh, you're kidding. Here, he was a booth announcer and a weatherman. Portions of uh, Indiana at one time yesterday were under a flash flood warning, but all of that seems of little importance once you take a look at the cloud cover photograph made earlier of the United States today. And I think you'll see that once again, we've fallen to the prey of political dirty dealings. And right now you can see what I'm talking about. The higher-ups have removed the border between Indiana and Ohio, making it one giant state. Personally, I'm against it. Charlie, as a booth announcer, David one night got very bored. He built a replica of this television station. Here's the result. It's quiet now in the television studios as we conclude another day of telecasting from WLWI Indianapolis, the Avco Broadcasting Corporation. It was great fun yesterday, riding around in the Duesenberg in Indianapolis, and you waved to everybody just automatically. Now let's go to some of yesterday's action. Uh, this is the finals of the women's 3,000 meters walk, right? Well, Charlie, here you see the leader, Olga Kristoff, who eventually will win this competition, leading very nicely. It's in the last lap of the competition, and right here you will see Australian Carrie Saxby pulled off the track. She'd been given a warning early in the race, and with two laps to go, she was caught for another violation and pulled off the track. But as you can see here, Kristoff is really moving, and I can't believe for one moment that at least a couple of times in the last lap she didn't have both feet off the ground. It's very difficult to judge this particular competition on indoor tracks that are rather bouncy, and it's difficult for the walkers to maintain contact with the track, but I have to tell you, many times during this race, she looked like she was out of contact with the ground. The referees have reviewed the films, has decided that this new world record where she shattered the old record will stand, and she is our champion in the women's walk. You can see that the Australian not very happy, but she didn't protest too vociferously, so she had to live with it. And the presentation of the medals. Now we move to the finals of the women's shot put, Dwight. Right? Charlie, here you see Ilona Brezhnev, the Olympic champion from 1980 in Moscow, on her fifth round throw, 66 feet, six and a half inches. That was good enough for the lead at the time. But here on the final round, final throw, Natalia Lisovskaya from the Soviet Union. 67 feet, four inches to come from behind to win on her final throw. And here are the official results now in the women's 800 meters. Christina Wachtel of East Germany wins the gold medal. And at time 201.32, there they are. And the winning time. Sedlakova second. Kiryakina finishing third. And now we go to the men's 400 meters. And here is a look at the field. Aryan Wiesermann of Holland is in lane one. Michael Franks of the United States is in lane two. Ian Morris is in three. Antonio McKay of the United States is in four. Roberto Hernandez of Cuba is in five. And Paul Harmsworth of Great Britain is in six. Frank? Antonio McKay should be the favorite in this race, especially since Wiesermann from Holland drew the inside lane. He's one of the best in Europe. He, he's probably the best of the Europeans, but even with this oversized track, I think there's a bit of a disadvantage running inside. That is Ian Morris in lane three of Trinidad and also from Abilene Christian College. Tomas Schoenleber, the indoor world record holder, 45-41. And this at 400 meters, two laps around this indoor circuit. Interesting to watch in this race. Ian Morris and Antonio McKay both have a habit of hanging back. McKay can win from the back or from the front. Michael Franks going out fast. He's going to be first off the turn. For Hernandez from Cuba breaks to the front. Michael Hernandez. Franks in second. With Antonio McKay and Michael Franks right behind him. It is Roberto Hernandez of Cuba. 
and Ian Morris makes his move on the outside. Morris moves for, for, for fourth and now for third, but he's held up. Has to stay back in fourth place. Roberto Hernandez out in front. And here come the two Americans, Michael Bray, Antonio McKay. Antonio McKay at the wire. Antonio McKay showing that you can come from behind on these big oversized tracks. Ian Morris in the blue and white trying to go by. McKay picks him up, doesn't let him pass. That's what's important indoors. Don't let that runner go by. He can hear Antonio McKay can hear his coach. Don't let him go by. And now with these Antonio McKay can really open up and just barely pass Hernandez, who really made the speed in this race. McKay won this race tactically. Hernandez's speed over the first lap gave him the great time. And Antonio McKay, of course, the 1984 Olympic favorite, settled for the bronze medal. He won a gold in the 4 by 400 relay. The luck of the Irish, Eamon Coghlan. Well, this weekend it was bad luck, and we'll have that story when we come back to the World Indoor Championships in Indianapolis. Now across the country and actually around the world, if you follow track and field, you know the in a way controversy and a bigger way disappointment of Eamon Coghlan this weekend. And it all started yesterday morning. Well, Eamon showed how you can lose out on something, think you're back, lose out, think you're back, and lose out again, all within the space of one day. So Eamon's been on an emotional roller coaster here. So, and there are a lot of stories involved, so we'll go back and we'll pick up all of the pieces and try to explain it for you, so just kind of follow right along with us. In yesterday's morning session in one of the heats in the 1500 meters, here's a look at Eamon Coglin in the green and white third runner from the back now making his move up the outside and he is moving into trouble and ironically Eamon was moving up to move out of trouble but three runners were in lane one and going into the turn two and a half laps from the end Eamon trips goes down rolls tries to get up and to qualify but again seeing it going into that turn three runners right in one spot and one goes down he got up and finished not in time to make the finals after a team appeal the referee put him back in the race Meet referee John Chaplin was just in looking at this very screen you're seeing to look at the replay of what happened to Eamon Coughlin. Eamon, tell us what occurred here. You're in the middle of the race right now. There's about three and a half laps to go, and you're running right now in seventh place, as I see. How well, do you feel at this point? Well, at this point, Jim Spivey was making a tremendous move, and I decided to come from the rear of the pack to get up in close contact in order to stay out of trouble. But as I was running wide on the bend, I remember being contacted from behind. I went right down immediately, and before I had time to think about it, I said, get up, go right after them, don't do a Mary Decker, don't stay down, and I sprinted as quickly as I could to catch up. Okay, now we have a better angle of this that's a tighter shot here as you have just over three laps to go in the race, and let's take a look and see what happened to you from this tight shot that we have. Well, as you can see here, I had just moved into contention on the outside of this gentleman here when I was caught from behind, and then my forward stride hit my left leg, and I went right down. And I decided, as I was hitting the ground, get up, get up, and relax and catch up with the runners. Don't stay on the ground. Just go after them, because there were still two full laps to go. We were almost all out. You lost 15 yards with three laps to go. Do you have trouble making it up? Well, I didn't have trouble making it up, but when I made it up there, I felt that this was after taking a little bit of the sting out of my legs, and I was a little bit concerned there for the home straight because I hesitated with about 10 yards to go. I was assuming at that point that I was going to qualify, and as I looked to my left, crossing the finish line, I noticed a German on my left side, and I go, oh, my God, did I qualify or did I not? And then I was told that I didn't qualify, but thank God I believe now that I have qualified. I'm in the final, and I'll be on the starting line tomorrow. At that point, Eamon thought he had qualified, but it wasn't to be. The jury overruled the referee. Eamon Coghlan is not in the final. Yes, I think that is the leg of, the, of, the, of this, this man, yes. yes. One more. Yes, it's going down. I think it is it's the leg of this. Yes. Not, not, not to the German, to the German. Athlete. No, 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 no. nothing to do with the German. Okay. It's okay. If you listen closely to the jury discussion, you heard them say that Bauman, the man behind, did not have contact with Eamon, and yet twice, Eamon said he was touched from behind. Now, in order to let Eamon into the race, they would have to disqualify Bauman, so they decided Bauman didn't touch him, Eamon's out, Bauman's in.
Eamon, after falling, then got up, caught up. We now have about a half a lap to go. Look, Eamon is in third place. That is important because the top three finishers in this, the second heat, will move into the finals plus the next three fastest times. So Eamon is in good position here, albeit a little bit tired. But watch what Eamon does. He slows down the last 20 meters right here. So in reality, the ironic thing is that Eamon himself kept himself out of the finals. But Eamon had one more mode of appeal. He wrote a personal letter. This is a copy of it to the jury. And in reality, what he said was that he thought there was contact with Bauman. Bauman had spike marks on him. If he could talk to everybody in the race and they all said, OK, would the jury let him back in the race? And Frank Shorter, what happened? Well, he talked to some of the competitors. The first two he went to said no. So Eamon was out. And so the last door was closed on Eamon Coughlin. And now let's come back to this point in time and go down to Larry. Thank you, Charlie. America has had a history of very fine 400-meter running, and today was no exception. Michael Franks, you were number one ranked in 400 meters in the world in 85. You're getting back to form, aren't you? Yeah, I feel like I'm getting back where I was then. I feel confident and strong. And being that it's an odd day of the year, it's been said that I run well through an odd day of the year. So maybe you know, this is an odd day of the year. Maybe this is what's going to happen. 87 might be your year in Rome as well. That's right. Listen, you couldn't have run your race any better, could you? I mean, you were right in position. It's just that you didn't have it coming down the home stretch the way I saw it. Right. You know, I feel like, you know, being in the inner lanes, you tend to uh, run a little tighter and you get cramped. And uh, coming off of it with that break, you know, everybody from the inside is going to come down. And it's, it's more pressure to really exert a lot of energy right there. And I may have tended to... Uh, do the same and tighten up a little bit. Okay, good luck. Uh, Antonio, your thoughts here. You ran the race that you wanted. You stayed close up in the lead, and then you kicked. Well, I felt real relaxed in the race. Uh, I knew Frank Segal and uh, go for the lead, and I respect him a lot. I knew it would be tough catching him uh, at the end. Like I told you last night, I was a little concerned about the first 200, but I got close enough, and uh, the Cuban really ran well, and uh, he the one, him and Mike, the uh, responsibility for the fast time. And this is for my baby girl, Antonetta Regina McKay. So uh, just a world victory for her. And uh, that's the main reason I'm running so well now is because of my little girl. Two, degree, two great events for Antonio McKay in the last nine months. When we come back, Leslie Seymour from the USA will carry the flag into the longest track race for women, the 3,000. <laughs> By now, we're live. <laughs> we are in Indianapolis at the first World Indoor Track and Field Championship. An excellent field, Missy Kane in the women's 3,000 meters. I think there's about seven women here who could all win. There's really, this is just as good or better than the Olympic final in Los Angeles. And we have the gold medal winner, Marchita Puka, and also Lynn Williams, who is a bronze medalist. And here's a look at the competitors. Uh, and this will be over 15 laps. Ingrid Delagrange of Belgium, Murray of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. That's uh, the way that it is always written now. Now, Mora Era Guevara of Peru, Marachica Puica of Romania, Leslie Seymour of the United States, Brigitte Kraus of West Germany, Ellie Van Holst of the Netherlands, Lynn Williams of Canada, Krishna Wood of Australia, and a couple of favorites right here, Olga Bondarenko of the Soviet Union and Tatyana, Tatyana Samolinko of the Soviet Union. And those are two great ladies to watch. And Leah Melis of Aruba. And so that is the field. But I would think that Marachika Puika is the one that everybody is going to keep their eye on regardless of where she is in the race. Last week, Charlie, she set a personal best in New York in our championships of 843. And she's 36 years old, but yet she keeps getting better. But she is a very good competitor. She always has a devastating kick. She should be the one. And she has indoor running experience because she has been running in the United States several times during the indoor season. A lot of the uh, a lot of the Europeans do not have the indoor experience that she would have. You're right, and that means a lot on a long, a big track. Even though this is indoor running, you've got 15 laps to go around, and if you're not used to it, it can really deaden your legs if you're not used to the boards. This is Mondo, but it does have boards underneath it. And you saw there number 173, Leslie Seymour, a member of the 1986 National Cross Country Team for the United States, and she is now fifth in the run. I would expect that Bondarenko wants to go out quickly. She's the very short Soviet. Right now, she's about in third position right now. That's Ellie Van Hulst that is trying to take the lead. And Della Granja of Belgium 
Finally sorts it out and dropping right behind her is Olga Bondarenko of the Soviet Union. She does like to run up front, as you mentioned. Charlie, she's a very good long distance runner. Last year, she was second in the world in the 3,000, the 5,000, and the 10,000 meter behind Ingrid Christensen. So she's very good over the long distances. She needs to push the pace from the beginning. Here comes Yvonne Murray, though, who won the European Championships a couple weeks ago. So Yvonne Murray moving up to second. She is from Great Britain. And also staying very close to the pace, Marachika Puika is running in fourth. So it is Delagrangia of Belgium. Murray of Great Britain. Bondarico Marachika Puika now has dropped back to fifth. You can see some pushing in there a little bit. It's so slow it looks like that they're going to have to some tactical errors right here if someone doesn't make a move and, and draw this field out. Krishna Wood of Australia is running fifth. And now the first pack begins to break away from three trailing runners. And we still have just over 12 and a half laps to go. I was going to say, Ellie Van Hulst has moved up to the 3,000. She was a good 800, 1,500 meter runner. She was going to run the 1,500 meter run, run here, but decided on the 3,000. It's good in this type of field right now to get up close to the front. In the middle there, you're going to have a lot of bumping, and that's what you don't want. That's what Eamon Coggan ran into. So right here, it's very tense because they want to get good position. And now let's go to Dwight Stones. Igor Paklin, the outdoor world record holder at seven, nine and three quarters. And he's over on his first attempt. And he stays in first place with teammate Gennady Avdienko, who will be next up at this height. They have had no misses, and they are jumping at seven, nine and three quarters currently. And I have a basketball report for you. We'll first give the replay here and then to the basketball report. Well, he runs the turn so well, and this is more like jumping outdoors here than it is jumping indoors. Very nice jump, just a little touch with the right calf. That's his best mark ever indoors. Igor Paklin of the Soviet Union. And as we go back to the race, uh, that basketball score double overtime final, North Carolina over Virginia, 84-82. That means that you'll be seeing North Carolina tomorrow here on NBC. And you are watching live the women's 3,000, a total of 15 laps here. Charlie, at the World Championships. Missy? It's getting very tactical. They went out in around 70 to 71, which is very fast, close to world record pace. But then the second lap, second 400 meters was about 72, 73 seconds, 224. That's why you see such a big bunch of runners right there. It's hard to run in the pack, but you see some smart people. Bondarenko is tucked in quite nicely, number 45. Lynn Williams, you don't see her. She's at the back of this pack. Oh, there goes Bondarenko. May have got a little pushing from behind by Marichika Buica. Yvonne Murray with the lead. Now Della Granja is in second. Bondarenka moving on the shoulder. Marichika Puika. Samolinko is running right behind that group. And then Leslie Seymour of the United States. Lynn Williams is there. Krishna Wood is there. As is Brigitte Krauss. And that is the front pack that will be interchanging back and forth. As we'll be going back and forth with our live coverage of the other events going on at the same time. Dwight? Gennady Avdienko, the 83 world champion. He must make this to stay in the hunt for first place. And he's over with a little touch, to almost the identical jump to Igor Paklin. These are both personal records for Paklin and Avdienko. And now they will be going to seven feet, 10 and a half inches for their next jumps. He's a very big guy, six, seven and a half, maybe 190. But watch how well he gets up into the air. Just a little touch with the calf. Avdienko and Paklin in the hunt. Next height, 7, 10 and a half, which would have been a world record at the beginning of this indoor season. Now as we come back to the race, the leaders will be lapping in a moment. Number 207, that's Leo Malis of Aruba, who was an added starter, and she is just out for a Saturday jaunt. Seven and a half laps to go in the women's 3,000 meters, and they'll be lapping the other runner. Yvonne Murray leading right here in the white and the blue on the side. She's from Great Britain. She won the European Championships. She's smart. She's pulling this out because look who's behind her, Marchita Puica, who's got one of the deadliest kicks around. Also, if you'll notice, number 100, Samalinko from the USSR. She had the best kick of ever last year at the Goodwill Games. 59 second last 400 in the 1500 meters. So watch her also. She looks very comfortable right now, and it's starting to string out a little bit. Yvonne Murray, Marichika Puica. Bondarenko, Samolinko of the Soviet Union, Ellie Van Hulst, Lynn Williams, Delagrange of Belgium in there, and she's beginning just to drop back after setting the early pace, but right now the race belongs to the front four. 
And that would be Yvonne Murray, Marochika Puika, Bondarenko, Olga Bondarenko, and Brigitte Klaus has dropped out. Brigitte Klaus of West Germany has dropped out of the race. You can just tell by the way they're running right now. They're going to their arms more. Their stride is getting longer. But look at Puika. She is in perfect position right here. They've got to run out some of the kick also of Samalenko. She's positioned in fourth right now, but she's running wide. The only good thing about this track, since it is a lot wider curve than you would have in Madison Square Garden, it's easier to run out there. Looks like she's trying to make a move here, but Bondarenko is also moving up. Lynn Williams right behind Puika, bronze medalist from Canada. She's trying to get up with the front runners right now. Lynn Williams is in reality trying to move inside of Bondarenko. She is running fourth or fifth with Samalenko of the Soviet Union just off of her right shoulder as Yvonne Murray of Great Britain continues to lead with Marachika Puik of Romania running second then it's Bondarenko, Bondarenko Samolenko running third and fourth and then it is Lynn Williams. Bondarenko is going to have to make a move. She's a long distance runner. She's the second woman to break 31 minutes in 10,000 meters so she's got the strength but she needs to make her move before the last two or three laps. And trailing this front pack is Krishna Wood of Australia. As the front pack now of six runners begins to pull away. And races, as you know, you take on a life of their own and packs take on a life of their own and they will move away. Then some people join them and drop out. But the race is now developed among these front runners, these six ladies. You've got to stay with that lead pack, Charlie, because the minute you lose touch with them your concentration is gone you think about the pain more right here if they can just concentrate almost like you're in a trance on the person in front of them and Yvonne Murray is doing all the work right there which is very hard four laps to go it is Yvonne Murray and now Bondarenko and Samolenko the Soviet Union moving up on the shoulder of Marichika Puika who continues to hold there in second Lynn Williams of Canada is running fourth and then running fifth is Kirshner Wood of Australia Samalenko looks very comfortable. She has a ponytail on the outside in fourth position, but Charlie, she's running so wide and you just lose ground. You want to stay inside because you have less ground to cover, but she looks so comfortable and she looks like she's ready to pounce any second. Here she goes. Looks like she's trying to make a move there. And we're beginning to lap some additional runners. Two to go. Things should heat up very quickly now. 400 meters. Someone's going to, looks like someone's just waiting. Who's going to go first? Yvonne Murray continues to lead Marichika Puika. Now the pace begins to quicken just a bit. There it goes. It looks like Puika is getting ready to begin her kick, and that's hard. You're passing runners, and sometimes that can get in your way. And Marichika Puika takes the lead. Samalenko goes right with her. And Bondarenko, the shorter of the two Soviet runners, Samalenko, also trying to pass her. Go ahead. Samalenko looks so easy here. I just, she looks like she could just sprint any second, and here she goes, and Bondarenko. This is the final lap, Marachika Puika, and here goes Tatiana Samolenko of the Soviet Union. As she strides it out, Bondarenko is caught behind Marachika Puika. Tatiana Samolenko of the Soviet Union. And now Bondarenko going off of the shoulder of Marachika Puika. But it's Tatiana Samolenko of the Soviet Union striding away. Bondarenko into second where she will finish. Marachika Puika coasts in to third. You can see why she won the Goodwill Games last year in Moscow. Her kick, she looked like she was out for a Sunday stroll instead of running a good pace. Her last 200 was 30 seconds, and I think she could have run faster. Tatiana Samolenko takes the gold medal in the women's 3,000 meters here at the World Indoor Championships. We've got a lot of action still left for you. Don't go away. We'll be back with more of the indoor track titles. First attempt at seven feet ten and a half inches. He and Avdienko have already set the Soviet national record at seven, nine and three quarters. This is one centimeter or about three eighths of an inch lower than he has jumped outdoors. Ladies He's already set his PR indoors. And that was an outstanding jump. He had the height. He just was out of position. This is a height he has never attempted indoors and he may have to make some adjustments on this particular surface. Packlin has a very long run. He's starting on the track. And the thing that's really good about Packlin is right here you can see he really runs the turn. He's running like he's a gyroscope into the middle of a turn. And he gets the height, gets his hips over, but just drags his left leg into it. I would not bet against him making this particular height. Meanwhile, as you can see, the award ceremony of the women's 800 meters, Christina Wachtel of East Germany with the gold medal. 
the 1987 Indoor European Champion and the winner at the TAC Championships last week. Sidlakova of Czechoslovakia finishing second. Kiryakina of the Soviet Union third. Our coverage, of course, as we mentioned several times, is live here from uh, Indianapolis. Let's now go down to Larry. Thank you very much, Charlie. With me, a man I think everybody recognizes, four-time Olympic gold medal champion, Carl Lewis. And Carl, what happened at the national championships? You and I chatted. I kind of know about your training. Tell the American public what you're doing. Well, what's happened, I'm really training for the outdoor season. And um, the American championships, I came up with a little bit of cold. And I just didn't quite have it. And, and Mark ran an excellent race as well as uh, Lee, so they made the team. But you know, I'm pleased, and I think they're going to run a good race today. Now, your training has been going well, correct? I mean, from what Every, you've told me. Right. Everything to me is excellent. I, as you know, I'm not really a person who really shoots for the end of season. And everything has gone excellent. And I'm looking forward to a great outdoor season. I know I can run the, the best I've ever run. Now, when we talk about indoor running, I think we should tell all our viewers here that you're talking about sharpening up and working on sprints and, and working on your, your sharp out of the blocks and that you're not focusing on that you're focusing more on 200 and 300 meter runs to get your conditioning down is that right, right. it's what's the thing i'm shooting for uh larry is trying to do the best outdoors because 100 meters is my race you know i feel it's my event and the only way i'm going to do that is stretch things out we have a world championships in august and september this year and there's no way to sustain it okay you're going to stick around for the olympics in 88 yeah i'll be here just i don't know about after that though well you'll be here after the 60 meter dash too for some comments let's go back upstairs to the booth We'll see him in Rome, of course, for the World Championships this year and in Seoul for the Olympics. That's what we look forward to. Most of all, I want to find out where he got that jacket. Isn't that a while? I've got to have one of those. We'll be back with more of our coverage of the World Indoor Championships in just a moment. The next men's running event will be the finals of the men's 60 meters. And the world record holder is in the field, and it is an excellent field, Frank Shorter. Mark Witherspoon of the United States, who we haven't mentioned, is right up there with Ben Johnson. And we could see uh, an upset here. Lee McRae, though, really has been the class of the indoor track season. But Ben Johnson really was other places. While Lee McRae was winning races in the United States, Ben Johnson was in Japan setting world records. All right, let's go back to the TAC meet a week ago in Madison Square Garden in New York City. And in lane. He obviously has a tremendous reaction time. And I think they're going to be able to really test this with these new blocks because he can't get a jump here. If he gets a jump and that jump is too quick, the blocks will pick it up. Mark Witherspoon finished second at the tack and, and Carl Lewis finished third. That's the reason that Carl did not, uh, is not running here because the, the top two... Uh, finishers are the men who qualified for the U.S. team. And in the United States, we really do have a winner-take-all attitude, and I, I think rightly so in these kinds of events, because where the athletes choose themselves for these championships, you will get most of the time, I'm not saying always, but most of the time, you will get the athletes who are running the best at that time of year, in and, that particular year. And Ben Johnson, who will be in lane three, is the world record holder. And Ben Johnson looked tremendous in the heats. I think all the people uh, who tend to wager a little bit on these events have their money on Ben. Ben Johnson now being introduced. As he comes down the track, and now Mark Witherspoon of the United States, who will be in lane four next to Ben Johnson, is being introduced. Francesco Pavoni of Italy is in lane five. These, of course, all being introduced here by Bob Hirsch, your public address announcer, who was the public address announcer for the Olympic Games in Los Angeles. Lee McRae of the United States just being introduced a moment ago. He's in lane six. And now we'll go back to the complete, uh, complete field. Christian Haas of West Germany is going to be in lane one. In lane two from Italy is Antonio Ulo. In lane three from Canada, this is the favorite. And there is a co-favorite with it, but Ben Johnson has to be the favorite in lane three, and he has really looked good here. In lane four, Mark Witherspoon. Now, this is a new face and a new body. He stands 6'3", so it's a disadvantage to be indoors because he doesn't have as much time. Oh, he's going to be excellent when we get outdoors. In uh, lane five from Italy is Francesco Pavani. In lane six, and I'm going to label him the co-favorite with a dynamite start, is Lee McRae. In lane seven, 
Bruno Marie Rose of France. Now uh, he's also a very tall sprinter and holds the record at 200 meters. And in lane eight is Ronald Deruel of Belgium. Bruno Marie Rose is 6'4". Oh, so we got a couple of tall sprinters in this. And uh, with the start so all important here, Frank, uh, it's difficult for a, a tall sprinter to win at 60. He can win at 100, but tall for him to win at 60. The, the shorter you are, the more quickly you can get up into your top speed form, which is standing up. You don't want to come up too quickly, but the shorter runner can get up vertical and running more quickly than the taller runner. And yes, it's usually from 60 meters on outdoors that the taller runners can catch up. So we'll know in this race, I think, 20 or 30 meters into the race, who is going to win, because it will, really will come down to the start. And you can reality, you can watch the red. Ben Johnson in red from Canada's in lane three. Mark Witherspoon in red, the United States is in four. Lee McCray, the United States is in red, is in six. So three, four, and six are the lanes to watch. Oh, there was just a little kind of a, a lean, and it was Lee McCray who had a little shoulder shrug. And they brought everybody up. And moments ago, this happened in the high jump, Dwight. Well, Charlie, what happened is Jan Zvara of Czechoslovakia has made 7-8. You'll see him here missing 7-10 and a half. He did not jump at 7-9 and 3 quarters, the height which the other, the Soviet athletes made. He had two misses at 7, 8 and 3 quarters and decided, I've got a medal. I'm bronze medalist for sure. I'm going to go for the win. So he took his final attempt at 7, 10 and a half. Now the Soviet athletes still have two more jumps left at that height. Is that a little strange form that he uses in the high jump? It just looks different. He's altogether a different jumper. He's a throwback from the old straddle form of, uh, of jumping, which we had in the 60s. But uh, he's done very, very well with that very strong technique of his. There was no false start call. Haas, Ulo, Johnson, Witherspoon, Pavoni, McRae, Marie Rose, DeRuel. That is the field. Ben Johnson is in three. Mark Witherspoon is in four. Lee McRae is in six. Marie Rose is in seven. And it is a fair start. No, they're going to bring him back. That was the blocks, Ooh. Charlie. I think the starter had them go off, and probably right as he was squeezing the trigger, the buzzer went off in his ear saying someone's left, and so he actually squeezed the trigger and heard the false start sign at the same time. I thought they got off. I thought it was an even, fair start. Ooh. These blocks are set up on a standard that says no human being can react to the sound of a gun faster than 12 one thousandths of a second. So that if 12 one hundredths of a second, pardon me. So if the athlete leaves the blocks before that, it's, it's a false start. All right, let's take a look. See if we can see. I don't see any, and I was going back and did anybody see any? Let's look again. I tell you what, let's look again. Dwight, you take lanes one and two, Frank three and four. Miss, you take five and six. I'll take seven and eight. But, you know, Charlie, it's difficult without seeing the flash of the gun. That's too. true. If all the athletes move or don't move at the same time, <laughs> it's, it's a, tough to it's decide. A it's a unified false start exactly. if they all go. That's true. Ooh, Ben Johnson was out real quick. Yes. All right, let's go down to Larry Rawson. But thank you, Charlie. I spent time with the Seiko people. They've had this equipment for three years. What it does is ensure everybody gets off to a fair start. The reason being, the activator in the back of their starting blocks will actually tell the starter in his earpiece if someone is trying to guess the start because it will push the block back, kick off the activator in less than 12 one hundredths of a second. The IAAF in tests has, has ascertained that it takes 12 one hundredths of a second for the body to react to the gun. That's what happened in this race. Quickly ask Carl if he likes that equipment. What do you think? I definitely agree with it. I think that everyone's trying to get an advantage, and Ben and Lee have always been very close getting off with the gun, and um, you just want to get a quick start. Carl, tell me something. I think this guy's holding them a long time. Two to three seconds seems long on the block. This is definitely a long time. I think what's happening now is that everyone is so concerned about keeping people from false starting that they sometimes hold you too long. Right. 
That starter that you see right down there, we can check the monitor right here. There you see them. They're wired over to that Seiko machine. And the fastest time ever recorded out of the blocks was done last evening in the trials by Stéphane Caristan of France. He got away in 13.4 one hundredths of a second. So no one yet is within one one hundredth of that 12 barometer that they've got. And interestingly enough, Greg Foster last evening in his world record race got out of the blocks in 16.7 one hundredths of a second. So he's got a little margin of improvement, Carl. Right. I think that um, as you get relaxed and get used to a starter, especially in a big competition like this, you, it, you need a few races, and for Greg to have run a race like that with such a quick start, then I think it's going to give him an advantage today. Let's go back upstairs for the call of the race. Maybe we'll get away this time, Charlie. All right, a moment ago, they came out and marked the false start against Ben Johnson. Then there was a conference between three officials, and he stepped out and marked the false start against Lane 1, and that's Haas of West Germany. Charlie, there are two aspects at work here. One is the athletes trying to get what we call a roll. They're trying to sort of roll up and not be set, but still rolling when the gun goes off. That's different from false starting, which is just trying to outguess the starter and start more quickly. The first time today we saw the starter decide everyone wasn't set. Everyone was kind of, some, someone was still moving. So he just said, come up, no false start. The second time false start, now these, these runners are really tight. Johnson is in three, Witherspoon in four, McRae in six. Seth. He does hold them. Johnson with a good start. McRae with the dynamite shot. Here comes Ben Johnson. It's going to be Johnson and McRae Witherspoon leaning in at third. 6.41 unofficial. If it holds, it's a world record. He flipped all the way over <laughs> the end there. He was going fast. Ben was not ready to stop after 60 plus, was he? You can tell by the determination on his face. I wanted that one and I got it. Ben Johnson still got the great start in lane three. He almost seemed to dip down a little bit, wind up and go. He had this race right from the start. Lee McRae was never in it. Ben Johnson showing why everyone watching him yesterday thought he was just going to run away with this. Great form. New world record, 6.41. And now let's watch this angle. Ben Johnson coming out. The secret here for him is he stays right in the middle of his lane. He's so strong, holds for him. Look at his head, doesn't bob. He doesn't care about anybody else. He knows he was out first. He knows he's the fastest man for 60 meters. He's just holding for him and running through. And very often when you're more relaxed that way, you'll run quicker. He was out first, so he didn't have to strain. He was able to hold his form. And that's what you call speed and momentum. And but he was first <laughs> over the barrier, too. <laughs> but Ben Johnson, <laughs> Ben Johnson is such a formidable looking athlete. You know, part of sprinting is psychological. And the other thing is, look at him compared to the other sprinters. I mean, he's such an imposing looking guy. He's so strong. And he showed it there because that didn't affect him at all. He says, well, uh, maybe we can try that again, see if I can get it right this time. So Ben Johnson, unofficial, has the world record in the men's 60 meters. We'll be back after these messages from your local station. Men's 400 meters. The ceremony. And there is your gold medal winner in the men's 400 meters. Now let's go down to Larry. As Antonio McKay celebrates, so won't these gentlemen here with me because they don't know. Do you know, Mark Witherspoon, that you tied the American record? Congratulations on a fine performance. Thanks a lot. Um, I felt pretty well in the race. I didn't have a very good start, as usual, in workout and stuff, but I'm going to work on it more in the next couple of weeks, and I should be able to run a couple of pretty good hundreds. You had a cold here, too, didn't you? Yeah, I had a really bad cold earlier this week. I, they had to take me to the hospital. <laughs> Well, America should know that you're also training with this guy right here, Lewis, down there, and tells, all right, uh, Lee, a new American record. Congratulations, six and 50 one-hundredths of a second for you. Thanks a lot. I was coming out here to run a good race, and uh, this, is, this is my first time running uh, 60 meters, so uh, I'm happy with that. Ben, the fastest reaction ever in history, 12 and seven one-hundredths of a second. Congratulations, and you are the new world indoor record holder. It's official, six and 41 one-hundredths of a second. You got it. Thank you. Really? It was a very good race, and I tried to mention my, in my form right too. And uh, the, the, the first, the first one was a very good, good um, question to, to, to the gun, and 
Got to cut it back. Right. Now, tell me, did you have problems when there's so many false starts coming out of the blocks? Did you still stay calm and under control? I, I must stay calm and just relax my mind and just concentrate on the race. That's the important part. Okay. Take a look at the replay over there. Did you guys come out of the blocks? Your thoughts? I, I come in the blocks pretty good and started to maintain my, you know, my position out the race inside the lift. And I feel pretty good. And I saw McGregor out there decide to change on the gear. Did Lee McRae, was he the one you worried most about in the race? Well, the outfield was running good, you know. I, I don't take everyone easily, so I just, I just go there and just do my job. Ladies and gentlemen, the fastest 60 meters or indoor dash ever run in history you've just been witness to here at the first World Indoor Championships as Ben celebrates by trying to make an Olympic diving team over the bar there. You okay? I'm fine. I'm all great. Right. Congratulations to all of you. Charlie, it's all yours. And congratulations to that man, Ben Johnson. As you know, he has a speech impediment. He has been working on it. And it's just, it's a great feeling to have him do that good an interview. Way to go, Ben, on both both phases of your life. The running also. He is the, broke his own world record, 641. And that's it. World record in the men's 60 meters, Ben Johnson of Canada. And we still have a lot remaining for you here in Indianapolis in the Hoosier Dome. Don't go away. We'll be back in just a moment. The women's 200 meters, the world indoor record, 2239. The great Marita Cook holds that record, and we have an excellent field here today. We could have a world record here because we have the lady that can do it. All right, in lane one is Angie Phipps of Canada. Mary Onyali is in lane two. Merlene Adi Page of Jamaica is in three. Heike Drexler in lane four, and lane four is where it will all happen. Grace Jackson is in lane five. She's from Jamaica. Alice Jackson, the United States, is in lane six. Now, Heike Drexler in lane four is the favorite. The race is between three, four, and five. Adi Page, Drexler, and Grace Jackson. I think and the interesting point to look at this is her coming out of the curve. She has such great knee lift, and I think that's going to be, watch that closely when she comes out of the first curve. And she has already won the long jump in this competition. So she has one gold going for her second. And Dwight Stone's mentioned that she could well go for four goals at the Olympics in Seoul. Already beginning to make up some of the stagger. Grace Jackson goes blazing by. Adi Page goes with her, though. It is Drexler and Adi Page. Drexler, watch her here. She's hugging the curve very well for a tall person. Look at that knee lift. And it is Drexler and then Adi Page and Grace Jackson. 22-28. She did it. Superstar. She, she can do it all. Once she said she didn't want to run anything like the 100 or 200, just stick the long jump. I think she's happy that she changed her mind. A world record back-to-back -back for Johnson of Canada and Drexler of East Germany. And there are the big three. Drexler, Adi Page, and Jackson. You saw them together. What a fabulous effort. She said yesterday she was worried a little bit about the turns because it's her first time, this meet is her first time running 200 meters indoors, but she did very well. <laughs> First time indoors at this meet. That's unbelievable. Here's an isolated look. Missy, just take us around. I'm surprised. She's so tall, but yet you can see her foot, foot plant right there. She stays in the curve very well. Look at her knee lift. Look at the muscles right there. This woman is a good long jumper, and I think it's paying off for her on the 200 and 100 meter races there. Good arm action. Some people have had a little bit trouble in the second curve, but she seems to handle it very well. Look at her. She looks effortless. She keeps her shoulders down, which is very important. Takes it all the way to the finish. She stands 5'11 and a quarter and weighs 152 pounds. All muscle. And all talent. And just a moment ago, Dwight Stones in the long jump. She won the long jump, and I think everybody was looking at Heike Drexler to set a world record every time she steps on the track, and no matter what event she's in, her best mark was 23, three and a half, which for her is a little bit less than what people would expect, but you have to understand she was getting ready to run a world record in the 200. The same thing on the runway, high knees, arms working well. She has the best technique in the event, and very early in the competition, she jumped 23, three and a half. Near the end of the competition, she had three fouls. I think she had the 200 meters on her mind once she knew she had the long jump title nailed down. And here are the results in the women's long jump, 23, three and a half. That is the winning distance for Heike Drexler. She now has a pair of goals at this first World Indoor Track and Field Championships. 
Well, we've seen two live. Well, we had a world record yesterday, Greg Foster in the men's hurdle. So let's go back in time and take a look at that world record. In yesterday's qualifying heat in the men's 60 meter hurdles, Greg Foster in lane seven, who has been flirting with world record marks, really nails this one. He sets it with a 746. Greg Foster and now let's go down and meet him. He's with Larry Rawson. Larry? The Chinese have the year of the dragon, the year of the duck. In tracking, you're not a dragon, but you had a great... You feel great. It's been a wonderful year. You had a great race. Is this your ultimate race? I mean, did you do everything perfectly? Did you make some mistakes? Actually, I think I made two mistakes. Coming off the first hurdle, I think I eased up a little bit. And coming off the fourth hurdle, I believe I eased up just a little bit. I uh, basically didn't run a full, complete race as, as I would have liked. And I think that's why I hit the fifth hurdle, you know, trying to get uh, too relaxed and not to push it, and uh, I end up hitting the fifth hurdle. But uh, I'm, I'm happy with it. All right, now, Greg, talk about this track. Is this faster than what you've been running on indoors this year, the wood surfaces? By far, it's the fastest I've run on at any indoor, indoor meet and any time in my life. Uh, it's a beautiful track, wonderful facilities, and I'm very pleased with it. I think uh, it's probably, if not the best, one of the best in the world. So you'll go to bed tonight with that thought that maybe I can do a couple of things more right even than right? I think so. I think if I go out here, come out here Sunday, basically with a clear head as I did today, and I think I'll be up more for that race because it is a final. And just, you know, come out and just run a complete race, hopefully. Congratulations on getting the pizza. Thank you. And he'll have a chance at another record in the finals tomorrow afternoon. We'll be back at 3 o'clock Eastern time. We're trying to see if Heike Drexler will talk to us. Uh, the negotiations are going on. Maybe we'll have that when we get back. We hope so. Stay tuned and see if we're able to pull off that coup. The Greta Garbo of track and field, one of the greatest athletes in the world with a world indoor record of 22-27. And right now, she's with Larry. Larry? Thank you, Charlie. I'm with the translator here, who is an American woman formerly from Japan, Zeglinda Moore. Zeglinda, would you ask uh, Heike, who does understand some English here, if she intends to run four events at the World Championship for three? Carl Lewis is done at the World Championships. What are her goals? What are your goals? Do you want to run four times or three times? Carl Lewis has run four times. Also ich will versuchen, jetzt nächstes Jahr zum Weltmeister zu schaffen, auf alle Fälle den Weitsprung, dann die 100 Meter zu laufen und eventuell in der Staffel mitzulaufen. Uh, nächstes Jahr, in next year, she wants to do the long jump, the running and the, um, the poles. She's going to long jump? Yes. And run the 100 meters? Yes. And the 200 meters? It's not maybe. Also it's not, uh, it geht nicht, weil es parallel zum Weitsprung ist. It's possible. Yeah. And you will run the relay? Four by 100? Yeah, the staffel. Staffel noch, ja. Tell us about this race. Did you hurt your ankle? Hast du deinen Ankel wehgetan? In the long jump. Ja, in the long jump. Ich bin ein, hab mir ein bisschen den Fuß vertreten im vorletzten Sprung, aber es ist Gott sei Dank nichts weiter, nichts Schlimmes. She twisted her foot just a little bit, but it doesn't, um, didn't hurt her, and she's fine. You know that you set a new world record. Yes, I, I'm really happy. <laughs> we'll be back. We'll be, ba we'll be back to Heike in just a second. But let's go right now to Charlie Jones. Charlie? And our congratulations to this lady. What a great athlete. And Dwight? Igor Paklin, outdoor world record holder, up for his final attempt at 7, 10 and a half. He and Avdienko, his countrymen, are still tied. They have no misses up until this height. If he makes this jump, his teammate, Avdienko, has a chance to match it, and then they would go to a world record. He, Paklin, on his second attempt, had plenty of height to make this bar and barely touched it with his left leg. So he has the potential, he has the strength to make this height. Oh, again, he has the height over the bar, but he just is a little bit out of position. Now it's up to Avdienko to make 240, 7, 10 and a half to win. If Avdienko does not make 7, 10 and a half, they will take a fourth attempt at this height. So there's still a chance that they will make this height. Again, he holds the turn extremely well. Watch his height, his hips over the bar. He's well up in the air, but he doesn't quite clear his legs in time and dislodges the bar with his lower body. Did he get airborne a little too far away from the pole? Exactly. In fact, with this track, as fast as it is, he is doing a very good job of converting his horizontal speed into vertical lift. He's almost doing too good a job. Oh, interesting concept by Dwight Stones. And we'll be back with more indoor action, including the men's 1500. So stay with us this afternoon. And also, we've got some golf waiting for you later. 
The attendance here officially is 20,023, 20023. That is the largest crowd ever for an indoor track meet in the United States. In the world, largest crowd ever for an indoor track meet in the world. So we're on a roll right now, a couple of world records, and we set another one right here. Now, this was early yesterday in the heat of the 1500 meters. Eamon Coughlin had problems. Eamon Coughlin in third place gets tripped by Dieter Baumann from West Germany, rolls, and Eamon did a very good job of rolling. If, if you've got to fall down, do it the way Eamon did, but he gets tripped right here, and you can see on the way down, he's actually planning on how he's going to get back up. See, he's trying to stay up. He says, no, I can't stay up. i got to roll, put my shoulder down, come up. Eamon tried to come back into it, tried to qualify, came off the final turn, got 20 meters from the end, and actually eased off. Every high school coach in the country is groaning because Eamon let someone by on the inside. So he is not in the 1,500 meters here today. And now the award ceremony for the women's 3,000. Tamalenko of the Soviet Union with the gold. Bondarenko of the Soviet Union with the silver. Meritika Puika of Romania with the bronze. Second silver medalist, Olga Bondarenko. USSR. And there is Bondarenko. Olga Bondarenko of the Soviet Union with the silver medal. Third, bronze medalist Marichika Puika, Romania. And with the bronze from Romania, here is Marichika Puika. Fast becoming a great favorite of American indoor track and field crowds. It's interesting, Charlie. We heard this year that she had retired, and but here she is back again. I just, she don't want to hang up her spikes, and she's 36, but getting better. Like a fine wine. <laughs> Tatiana Samolenko, the gold medalist in the women's 3,000 meters. Now, just a moment ago, we had another miss in the men's high jump. They're sorting it out, and the all-time expert, Dwight Stones, will tell us what they're going to do, because you know, man. <laughs> well, Avdienko had a third attempt at 7, 10 and a half. If he'd made it, he would have won the competition outright. He just barely misses it, and now they're faced with a jump off. Now, it seems very unusual to me that international officials have problems with how to run a jump off. It is very simple. Usually, you take... when you're jumping, you just go over and tell them and they do what Dwight says. Exactly, what happens. but I'm up here now, and there's nothing I can do about it to affect it. They should take a fourth attempt at this height. If neither one of them misses it, they should go back to the last height that they both competed at, which is seven, nine, and three quarters, but they are having arguments, discussions, et cetera, as to how they're going to handle it. All right. Well, that's all being sorted out. The next running event, the men's 1500. Eamon Cogden is the world indoor record holder, and of course, as you know uh, from the updates, that he will not be in this race. This is seven and a half laps. Dieter Baumann of West Germany, Lambruschini of Italy, Kulker of Holland, Chariot of Kenya, Jim Spivey of the United States, Dave Campbell of Canada, Marcus O'Sullivan of Ireland, Hillard of Australia, and Jose Abascal of Spain. That is the nine-man race. Charlie, this race is a bit different from people who've been watching the indoor season so far this year because there will be no rabbit in this race. Usually they will have someone in the race who is brought in specifically to set the pace. None of these competitors really wants to be in the lead. So someone will have to take the lead. And then over the course of the race, someone, most likely Jose Abascal from Spain, will take it and really start to run. And Jim Spivey in lane five of the United States. And uh, from Canada, Dave Campbell with the red hair. 
as we swing across outside to Jose Abascal. And remember, this is a 200 meter track, so only seven and a half laps. And a lot of times you see indoor at an 11 lap to the mile, but this is 1,500 meters, the metric mile, seven and a half laps. And Dieter Baumann from West Germany takes the lead. And Dave Campbell of Canada goes with him, and Abascal moves up on the outside. And they're running very leisurely, 15 seconds, 16 seconds for the first. 110 meters, not very fast. And again, you can see, and the crowd's reacting because Jim Spivey from Indiana University taking the lead. He's from Bloomington, and Spivey has the lead. And running right behind him is Jose Abascal of Spain. So it is Spivey of the United States, Abascal of Spain. Hilliard of Australia is running third. I've always, of West Germany is fourth. Go ahead, Frank. I've always wondered that these 1,500-meter runners, the milers, they're on the European tour. They all know each other. Spivey knows Abascal. Maybe he said, look, I'll take it for the cu first couple of laps. You take it for the next two laps because we both know we have to get away from Marcus O'Sullivan. Maybe that's what's going on. So Jim Spivey, United States, continues to lead Jose Abascal of Spain, is running second. 61-7 on the split. Very leisurely. Again, it's a kicker's race if it doesn't speed up. Marcus O'Sullivan, second from the last in the green, in perfect position, running on the inside, saving space. But Jim Spivey just content to lead, to jog along. And I think it's going to stay this way for a while until Jose Abascal or maybe Dieter Baumann decides to take the lead. With four and a half laps to go, it is Jim Spivey, Jose Abascal, Dieter Baumann, Mike Hillard of Australia, Dave Campbell of Canada, Han Kulker of Holland, Kip Koet's Chariot of Kenya, Marcus O'Sullivan of Ireland, and then it is Alessandra Lam Lambruschini of Italy trailing. And now the move being made on the outside, and that is Kip Koet's Chariot. And Jim Spivey beginning to accelerate. Mike Hillard from... Australia coming up but deciding no I don't want the lead yet it's too far from the end Abascal right now they're playing right into Marcus O'Sullivan's hands someone's going to have to go I really wish Jim Spivey could let someone else take the lead two minutes 1.7 seconds at 800 meters again they're still literally jogging along waiting for someone to take the lead Three laps to go, and the local favorite, Jim Spivey, with a chance, Spivey, Spivey, as he comes past, this, past the finish line. Something's going to happen, and it's going to happen soon. And here comes Marcus O'Sullivan with his move on the outside as he now slides up to fifth place. But the reason for his doing that is he doesn't want the lead. He just wants to be close when whoever is going to take the lead takes it. O'Sullivan, I don't think, will take the lead until someone else goes, and there goes Abascal. Two laps to go. Jose Abascal has the lead. Now they were bunched on the straightaway. They begin to string out on the curve, and Jose Abascal striding away from Jim Spivey. And then it's Hillard. And now here comes Marcus O'Sullivan. Hillard and running. Michael Hillard of Australia. Hillard running well, holding off O'Sullivan. Spivey, Spivey hanging in there, but Abascal starting to run away with this. Someone better come on. It's Abascal, Spivey, O'Sullivan inside of Spivey. He moves into second right at the bell. One to go. And Jim Spivey may have given Marcus O'Sullivan this race because he didn't have to let him go on the inside, but he did. And the one big move by Marcus O'Sullivan, and he goes by Abascal. Abascal holds him up. He'll take him wide to the turn. That will cost Marcus about three more strides, lengthening the race. And here comes Marcus O'Sullivan. He's got him. He's out in front. And he beats him just by half a stride. 3.39.05 unofficial. You can't get a race any closer than that. 53 seconds for the last 400 meters. Tremendous sprint. And now it's for certain. If Jim Spivey had not let Marcus O'Sullivan go on the inside, O'Sullivan would not have won that race. Abascal running very, very smart around the last turn holding O'Sullivan off. And it takes a lot of effort to hold someone off on that last turn. You can't get any closer than this. O'Sullivan would have wanted to go by him on the back stretch. This is the back stretch of the last lap. O'Sullivan says, I got to get by before the turn. Look at that. Abascal looks over and says, uh-uh, not until we get around the turn. I'm holding you off. And he runs a little harder, pushes, holds O'Sullivan out. You have to have a meter before you can cut in. O'Sullivan, I think he actually dropped back a little bit, saved it, and now he grits his teeth and pushes. Abascal does not give up. This is one tough man on the inside. They're both dead at this point. Their legs are just aching. The crowd still reacting to the replay finish on the screen, and O'Sullivan just barely 
barely holding on. Fourth time this season that O'Sullivan has defeated Aviscal, and even without him and Conlon, Conklin, Ireland comes off the winner. And the crowd reaction to the time of vision here, they're enjoying it for the second time here at the Hoosier Dome. We'll be back with more of the World Indoor Championships in just a moment. Don't go away. The first IAAF World Indoor Championships have been brought... Uh, Irish men are miling. Irish eyes are smiling. Marcus, the pace, was it good for you in the beginning or was it a little too close to the finish? Uh, pace is very slow at the beginning. I heard splits. That didn't correlate with the race. There were 69. I saw on the clock 69. I knew they were in 69. Uh, I think they were closer to more like 60. But... Uh, I was very, very frightened that I would get stuck behind the bunch and miss the break that I expected Abascal to make, and he did. And uh, luckily enough, I got around everybody and covered it. Okay, now, if you had it to do over again, would you have changed your tactics a bit to move with a lap and a half to go or so, or what? Uh, I keep saying I would, but no me, it's the same story every time. I, uh, I think I would have done the exact same thing. All right, now, what happened on the turn? Did you feel that you had enough left? What were your thoughts going through with about... 50 or 80 meters to go. Uh, I didn't know if I could hold on. I knew I, I couldn't cut in on Abascal at that stage because I hadn't. I knew I hadn't gone by him. Uh, he made another attempt. I just said, relax, take it easy. You still have another 50 yards to go. My legs were my, my legs at this stage were coming from under me, but I did everything I could. I just didn't want to lose more than I wanted to win. One quick thought: I got to go to the booth. But did you ask Spivey to move out on the inside so you could get by, or did you just see the opening? Saw the opening. That's it. Okay. Congratulations. Thanks very much. World Championship. Thanks. Charlie? Thank you, Larry, and here are the official results. Marcus O'Sullivan's winning time is 3.39.04, followed by Abascal Cooker, and Spivey, who did all of the work, Frank, ended up in fourth place. Wait, we, uh, we got to get your mic open, Frank. All right, now go. I think it's unfortunate, really, that Spivey had to lead for so much of the race, but it seems like it was his choice. I guess he decided at least he wanted to run fast, and very often it's a it's a subconscious decision. Maybe he was just giving away something to O'Sullivan and Abascal. Missy Kane, your reaction of today? Well, I thought, as far, overall, I thought it was a wonderful meet, and Heike Dressler, she performed so well, and I think we'll see more from her later on. The 1500 was great. Marcus O'Sullivan, he always heard make one move and make one move only, and he did it great. Right. Well, obviously, the field events were outstanding. Drexler maybe didn't set the world record in a long jump, but she got it in the 200. And the men's high jump, we are still pending uh, a jump off, and they're still supposed to jump at 7, 10 and a half, a height that was never made before this indoor season. And we will stay here, and we will do an update inside of the golf, so we will have that. By the way, just uh, for your note, we have had five world records so far in the men's 60 meters, the women's 200, in the men's 60 hurdles yesterday, the women's 3,000 walk, and the men's 5,000 meter walk. And there is more to come tomorrow here on NBC. The executive producer of NBC Sports is Michael Weissman. The coordinating producer of track and field is John Gonzalez. Produced by Carla Ingelman. Directed by Andy Rosenberg. Our technical director is Steve Cimino. Tomorrow, the action from Indianapolis continues. Sergei Bubka in the pole vault, Greg Foster in the hurdles, and much more on Sports World at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. For Frank Shorter, Dwight Stones, Missy King, Larry Rawson, I'm Charlie Jones at the World Indoor Championship. Stay tuned for golf. It's the Honda Classic next on NBC Sports.